Okay, it's a special day. We have Otto Rent Hasselt. I'm probably saying his name wrong. <laughs> That's okay. But notice in his in the first part of his last name, which is Van, is lowercase. So when you cite him, cite him lowercase for the Van part. Which actually need, need, means you need curly brackets in your big tech file. Don't ever use big tech. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually make it work for you. You can do the right thing. I was here <laughs> some years ago. I guess we worked out. Six and a half years ago was when you left? No, five ish. Five years ago. Still six long. Was he arrived? I don't know. <laughs> he, he did all this great work. It seemed like. It seems like you're like a, such a wonderful colleague. I can't believe you're only here for a year. It was only like a year. Yeah. It's just a wonderful year. Uh, and and then you went on to the, to the dark side, you went to industry. Yeah. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> um, uh, and did, and did lots of good stuff there, and become become prominent, important there. Uh, he's. Um, He's one of the leading people in reinforcement learning there. Uh, and yeah, it was just so good to have you, you know, back here returning some of your thoughts. And so let's all give him a warm Edmonton welcome. Thank you, Rich. Um, yeah, so it was a while. I was surprised to find that it was five, five years. And it's good to be back. It's nice. It's nice to be back here. It's a lovely campus. Nicer than the London campuses, I would you say. Ready to come back? <laughs> <laughs> no comments. Let's dive in. Um, so I thought today I'd talk about, uh, well, it says up there, when to use parametric models in reinforcement learning. And the way I'm going to, so there's a, a paper link there that you can look at for more details, because I'm basically just going to talk about stuff that is also in that paper. But I thought I'd structure it a little bit differently. I'm going to structure it more in the way we came about, like the thinking that we did and why, why did we ask certain questions, how do we come to certain conclu conclusions. Um, so also in addition to the results and the, the, the thoughts that we had in this space to also maybe share a little bit of the like, how did we get there? What, what, what led us to, to asking these questions and such. Okay, so um, to start with, the motivation was actually a different paper that came out not too long ago, a couple of months ago. A paper called Model-Based Reinforcement Learning for Atari. And I'll briefly describe what happened in that paper. And it's a fairly, in some sense, it's a fairly standard thing where they do something that is quite similar to Dyna, if you know the Dyna algorithm. And it's schematically depicted there. These plots are from that paper. It's schematically depicted there where there's a policy depicted as the robot, interacts, leads to some observations or transitions. Um, then they use these observations to learn a world, mo world model. This is, they call this self-supervised, but it, this is basically a supervised learning problem, right? Where, where you can learn from transitions to predict what a transition, like the outcome of a transition will be. And then they use this world model to generate new experience to then learn a policy from. This is, like I said, very similar to what Dyna does. This other picture I'm not going to explain, but it's just to show that there's a lot of work in that paper in describing and explaining how exactly they structure that world model, and that's a non-trivial thing. And maybe a lot of the focus of that paper is more on that side. Um, like, how can you do that? Because it's actually kind of tricky to make good models in rich um, perceptual spaces, like in these Atari games. Um, and even harder maybe in more structured, like richer spaces. And then they show that doing that, you can get relatively good performance. And with relatively good, I mean literally compared to something else, where they have a baseline there, which is in this case Rainbow DQN, which is one of the deep QNet algorithms, um, one of the later ones that is a little bit better than the original DQN algorithm. And they use it as a comparison point, and they show that they do a lot better. Importantly, the uh, comparison here is on a much lower number of interactions with the world than is typically done for these DQN style algorithms. Typically, in most papers, um, people use 200 million frames. They only use 400,000 frames or 100,000 uh, 100, interactions because each action is repeated four frames. The Rainbow DQN algorithm in the paper is uh, said to be tuned, but I'll argue that you can actually tune it much better than they did, apparently. Um, 
But this raised a question for me, which is basically, so why does the parametric model in this case perform so much better than the replay? Because this rainbow DQN algorithm, being one of the algorithms in the family of, of DQN algorithms, uses replay. Now, how does replay work? Let's compare it to a model. So a model is a function, essentially, that takes a state and an action as an input, and it outputs a prediction of the reward in the next state. I'm not being very formal in these slides, so I don't have expectations, or I don't even talk about whether this is an expectation model or a sample model. I'm just going to stay fairly high level. And then you can use a model to plan, spend more compute to improve predictions and policies. And I'm going to argue you can also plan with experience replay, where a replay is basically a buffer of experiences where you can look for a, for a state action pair that you've actually seen before. You can see what the reward and subsequent state was when that happened. <clears throat> so functionally, this looks very similar. It's not quite a model because you can't query it anywhere else than you've actually been. So it's not a full model. But if you look at the uh, state action pairs that you've observed, it's very much like a model and you can, you can query it there. So there are certain things you cannot do with a replay buffer that you can do with a model, but there's um, certain things that you can do, and most notably, I'm going to define planning here as basically anything that spends compute to improve your predictions and policies without consuming additional experience, which is maybe a slightly broader definition of planning than a lot of people use when they maybe think more concretely about planning like actual predictions of the world or something like that. So I'm slightly more general flavor for what that word means. And then you could say replay is also doing planning. Now there's a couple of important differences. Um, I'm sure Rich would object if I didn't mention them at least. Um, typically models use less memory because in a replay buffer you have to store all of these transitions um, and in a model you just have this one parametric thing which can be fairly large but it's still probably going to be less memory than a whole bunch of frames and typically it uses more compute because that one step of that function, uh, you saw the big network before, is typically a lot more expensive than sampling a transition from your replay buffer. It's a little bit contentious because of course um, it could be that the more expensive bit is to then use that transition, and then maybe the planning with the model is not that expensive, but it is typically a bit more expensive. But the question I'm mostly going to focus on, how do these things compare in terms of data efficiency and performance, rather than these computational and, uh, well, these computational differences, essentially. So here's a generic algorithm, won't go into too much detail, it's not that complex, but the most important things that I wanted to basically highlight here is there's basically one outer loop, this is the total training loop, and then there's two inner loops. The first inner loop is to say, I step a couple of times in the real environment, and the second inner loop is, to, is then, I sample a couple of transitions from my model, and I use those to update my predictions and policies as well. These can happen at the same time. Um, Rich likes the notion of planning in the background. I'm not, I'm not going to basically argue for one way or the other. In this, in this figure, it's basically depicted sequentially. Um, that, that's not the important point here. The important point is more that there's a, a number of interactions you do with the world and this can be um, phrased in two numbers, a number of iterations that each consists of a number of interactions with the real world and there's a number of updates that you do which is related also to the number of iter uh, iterations that you do but then it's also related to how much planning you do per iteration. So these numbers are going to be important in this talk and additionally I'll get back to that but for now I'm just going to note it and then you can forget it if you forget it. There's an important state sampling distribution over there. This is basically the starting points of each time you plan with your model. But I'll mention that again when it becomes relevant. First let's focus on these three quantities. Then the algorithm that I, uh, th from that paper that was our motivation to, to talk, they, they call that uh, algorithm simple by the way. Um, and they do 16 iterations where in each iteration they do 6,000 ish steps in the real, like in the environment, in these Atari games in this case. And then they actually do a whole lot of planning. They use a whole lot of samples for planning in each of these iterations. So in total, there's a lot of compute that goes into these things, but there's not that much data that goes into them. So that was their claim also. It's data efficient. They don't say it's necessarily very compute efficient. Now, of course, this is important because if you're going to interact with, say, the real world, you might have quite a bit of compute available per step in the environment if, if the environment is relatively uh, uh, expensive to sample. Now a standard DQN-like setup, and Rainbow DQN used exactly the same numbers here as the uh, DQN uh, algorithm from the Nature paper, 
Um, the numbers might look a little bit unfamiliar because I say it's doing 12 and a half million iterations where in each iteration it does four real steps and then it does 32 planned steps. You may, if you know DQN algorithms, you might remember 200 million frames. So how do these numbers compare to that? Well, actually, four times 12 and a half million, that would be 50 million steps. But each, steps is repeat, each step is repeated for four, ac uh, for four frames. And that's exactly how you get the 200 million. And the 32 is basically the mini batch size that the EQN uses. Each four steps, so each 16 frames, um, you sample a mini batch of 32 transitions and you do one update. Now, we, for this paper, we tuned it to be more data efficient because we wanted to have more of a like for like comparison to that algorithm to see can we say something about the comparison of replay to versus parametric model. So we basically tuned uh, a data efficient rainbow DQN, just a few small changes that we made. Maybe the most important one is that we just spend a, uh, a lot less uh, compute and data. Where we did 100,000 iterations, and in each iteration we only do one step in the environment, so basically you just do 100,000 steps. But then for each step we also did one mini batch from your replay. So we're, using a we're doing a little bit more planning than in the uh, original Rainbow DQN, but actually not that much more. It's like we're using eight times as, uh, or four times as much um, experience on these first 100,000 steps. Turns out this is um, like to change the same numbers, to say these same numbers in a different way. It means we use the same number of total experience for the data efficient rainbow to make it a like for like comparison. And in total, of to total planned experience, I would say it's also a similar number. So in the simple algorithm, they use like 15 million samples from the model. We use like 3 million samples from the replay, but roughly the same number, let's say. And then turns out that actually performs better. Now, this was not something that we just happened to stumble upon. This was basically literally the first thing we ran because we had the intuition that it should perform better. So I'll explain why we had that intuition and why we expected that this result would, would emerge. Um, whereas, of course, the canonical rainbow was not tuned for this low data, data regime and did, did a little bit worse. And to understand, like, why do I think this is better, I'll... Um, now let me say a little bit more right now. So maybe the, the, the intuition here is what were they actually doing in that algorithm, um, that model-based algorithm, they were still sampling from the real states that you've seen and then planning forwards from those. Now the intuition why would the replay do better was if you have a replay memory, this is in some sense a perfect model because the transitions that you'll sample from the things you've seen will be things that actually emerged. If you're learning a model, there will always be some little bit of error. So it would be unintuitive to me if you use your parametric model in exactly that way, it would be a little bit unintuitive to me that it would work better. It's not 100% a given, like you could argue, maybe the model generalizes better, maybe it will give you lower variance, like samples. But I, I kind of expected that to not to be the case, and these results seem to at least not invalidate that hypothesis. <coughs> So this is in the deterministic case, right? Where the environments are deterministic. Um, in this case, the Atari games are um, deterministic, um, but I expect that these results will hold up as well when they're not. Um, we did some experiments in smaller scale things where we also tried stochastic environments, and it seems like the conclusions basically still hold up. Do, do you not have sticky actions? For this one, no. This is uh, this is comparing on the um, basically the original ALE, like they didn't have the sticky actions. This is also where the original Rainbow paper was run on. Um, I agree with these concerns, by the way, and it's really good to also do that. So we did it at smaller scale. We didn't run the sticky actions uh, at Atari, but we did smaller scale experiments where we did also add the stochasticity because this interacts really importantly in different ways with models and replay as well. Yeah. The model can also take arbitrary actions, right? When you when yeah. Yeah. So it's a great point. So um, with the model, you can consider arbitrary actions that you didn't actually take in that state, right? With replay, you can't exactly do that. Now, of course, you get a little bit of a mixture step there still, because if you imagine the replay buffer, let's say for simplicity, your replay buffer contains all the experience you've ever seen. For 100,000 frames, this is exactly what we did, right? We just stored like we we didn't have to limit the size of the replay buffer. Um, and remember that we're learning this parametric model from those same experiences. So if you're going to consider an action that you've never taken in a state, 
you're still taking a little bit of a leap of faith, right? Might still be good because it might be that it generalizes well. You took that same action in a different state, but it's similar enough and so on. But remember that we're eventually learning a value function from this, an action value function. And I like this quote by Vladimir Vapnik who says, never do uh, as an intermediate step a more general problem, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but never do solve a more general problem as an intermediate step to solving the thing you actually care about. So if we care about, say, the policy or the value function, you could make an argument that you shouldn't first learn a model and then learn that from the model, because this will be an indirection which maybe can only hurt. Now that can only part, that's not very satisfactory because we all believe that models should be useful in one way or the other. So what we did then is, well, we investigated this question, when do they help? How can you make these models actually be useful? And we had a couple of intuitions there. So that maybe what we're doing here in that simple algorithm is maybe not the most effective way to use your model. What is it doing? It's planning forwards from real states. And then, as I said, maybe replay can be considered a maybe a more accurate model from exactly those states, right? So we did a small scale experiment here on a, on a maze where we have like, we can do more experiments because it's so small, right? And basically here, this performance on the y-axis is the way to think about it. This is the total number of steps it takes you to complete 25 episodes. So lower is better. And you can see replay kind of dominates uh, the forward Dyna algorithm here uh, over like, if you do different numbers of updates, planning updates per real step. So it seems quite consistent. I say forward dyna here because from each state and action that we actually visit, we plan a step forward and we then we use that to update the value. Now there's a different thing you could do. You could plan forward, but you could not trust the experience quite so much. Why would you do that? Well, if your model is a little bit wrong, let's say the model thinks there's a hole in this wall over here, right? If you're then using that to update your value function, your value function will say, it's really effective to go over here. It'll be a really short path outside if I want to flee, let's say fleeing is good. Um, that might not be a very good thing to cache. Eventually you'll learn it's bad and your value function will relearn that it's not so good, but you have to unlearn that thing that you've learned. So what do I mean with forward planning for behavior? I basically mean that you still plan forwards, but you only change the action that you take. You don't actually cache that experience as if it's real. You're only trusting it to inform your behavior. What would happen then is I would still go there because it still looks good, but then I would notice it's not actually good, but I would only actually cache, I would only actually learn from experience that is real and it would never have the whole that is not actually there. That was the intuition. This is something you cannot do with replay because this requires you to plan for from the actual state you're in right now, right? And that one typically just isn't in your replay. Now you could think about doing things to extend it and people have, where for instance you could cre create a non-parametric model say using nearest neighbors or something, to augment your replay into a model that you can query, also at your current state. But if you just consider like a raw replay, it's just not possible, you can't do that. But this is showing that if you use a parametric model, if you plan forward, zero step will be like just Q learning, and then one step is doing like one step with your model, and then doing like Q learning on top of that in some sense. You can see that it actually gets quite, quite a bit better quite fast. And this is very naive planning, right? We're not doing anything smart, this is breadth first planning, just picking the max. So that seems like maybe that's a promising way. This is also exactly what happens in uh, model predictive control. And that seems a very effective method, right? So this is just validating, yeah, sure, this, this seems an intuitive thing should work. Good, it works. And then the other thing that we considered as an alternative, remember we did forward planning for credit assignments. You plan forward, you update your value function. We argued that maybe is a little bit tricky. You could always also plan backwards. Now, what is the difference? When you do replay, there's no difference because you have a real transition there. You could consider like the end point of the transition, the thing, and then, or you consider the starting point. It will be the same thing, right? But if you have a parametric model, there's a difference here. And intuitively, you can think about it like this. If you have a real state, but your model is a little bit faulty, it has some errors, and then you plan forward, you can basically get a garbage transition, and now you're updating the value of a real state with garbage data, right? If your model is bad there. Now, if your model is equally bad, but you do backward planning, what will happen is you'll use a real state to bootstrap upon and update a garbage fictional state. That seems intuitively much less likely to be hurtful, especially if your space space is quite big. So this garbage state that you're updating is not something that you'd actually run into, right? It's not that you update some real state. No, you really, really update a fictional state that wouldn't exist. So then we would expect that maybe planning backward in that sense might be a little bit more effective if you're doing it for credit assignments. And the uh, experiments that we ran, uh, this is on four rooms, uh, same grid world as over there. They basically uh, highlight that. 
And this, in this case, by the way, you can see deterministic and stochastic, so we're also like planning with stochastic models. Replay is still a little bit better in this case, it's not always necessarily the case, but it is in this case. Um, so I'm ready to say conclusions, because there's basically two things that I said here. One was to consider replay as something that you can use to plan. That you, it's okay to call that planning, I would argue. Even if it's a limited form, because you can't do everything that you can with a parameter model. And if you want to use a parametric model, there's at least a couple of different ways to use it. One would be for planning for credit assignment. And I've basically argued maybe that's not the most effective way to use a parametric model. And in fact, if you want to do that, maybe you could also consider doing replay. Or you could do forward planning for behavior. That seems to be quite effective. And as I said, there's a lot of literature on that, like model predictive control that basically does that all the time. And backward planning for credit assignments. And I basically just wanted to, none of these are particularly new. I'm not claiming I'm inventing these things. I just wanted to do like a careful comparison of these things and get some intuitions about when you can expect them to, to help. Okay, thank you. Of course, Rich. Uh, just for clarification, you, you talked about backward planning. I didn't quite get what you meant by that. I know it's something simple. Can you just tell me again what it is, by the way? In this case, yes, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I deliberately didn't go into a lot of details. So by the way, if you're confused about anything, please ask, because there's lots of hidden details, of course. In this case, for backward planning, we literally did an inverse model, a slightly awkward one, where normally a model would give you, like you take a state and action as inputs, and your output is your reward in the next state. And actually, we also uh, output, uh, in this case, maybe the discount factor, which would basically be zero or one, because you either terminate your episode or not. Um, the inverse model, we literally inverted that. So the inputs were the reward, the discount, and the next state. And the output would be the state and the action that preceded that. That model is conditional on the policy. So, and we were just doing this online. So the model would be a little bit wrong in the sense that it would basically be for the mixture of all policies that you've done. But we just ignored that and we just said, well, we'll do just do the simplest thing. We'll just invert the model and we'll see how that goes. I think it's a big open question how you should be doing backwards planning if you want to do that. So you, you make this inverse model, which yeah. tells you the predecessors of any state. Yeah. Um, then what do you do? And then you just use that transition. In this case, we just did one step like, uh, so we, we generate this one transition using your inverse model. And then you just use that to update the value of that predecessor state. Inverse models give you the predecessors yeah. of a state. How does that transition? So now you have, uh, now you have a, a, a state and an action, which were the output of the inverse model, and the inputs of the inverse model. So you have a state, an action, a reward, a discount, and the next state. That's a transition. So the inputs to this thing were, like I said, maybe a little bit awkward. We, we put, we, as the input, we literally put in the outputs of the normal model. So. The actual reward you've seen in the actual state you've seen, and then you ask what were the things that led to there. Of course, separately, you could also do other things. You could take a state, you could ask what could have been the likely state and action that led there, and then given all of those, you could ask what would have been the reward along the way, right? There's different ways you can stagger these uh, computations. In this case, we just did it as a kind of like a flat thing. Not saying it's the best way to go, but it's a simple thing. Would it be fair to say that you cannot get any benefit from your parametric model over replay unless you have certain inductive bias in your model which allows you to generalize beyond the data you have seen? So we had that intuition, like let's make the parametric models win, let's give them the right inductive bias. Even that doesn't always work. But you're, you're always starting from the state that you have seen. Yeah. So if you, so let's say you have this four room domain, but there's one room that you have never been to, but if your model generalizes to that room, yeah. your replay doesn't have that data. So if yes. you can, if you have a generator model that gives you something like that, yeah. that you haven't seen, and if your model has right inductive biases baked in, which that's a generalized outside the data distribution, that, yeah. that other room, yes. then you should get benefit from a parametric model which you cannot get from a replay. Yeah. So unless you have inductive biases baked huh. in, and you yeah. plan out of data distribution that you have in your buffer, you cannot get any benefit out of your parametric model. So two things about that. So, so I mostly agree with what you said, but I want to make basically two addendums. Um, so one is the forward planning for behavior and the backward planning for credit assignments, I think are also both ways that you can benefit from a parametric model, maybe in addition to replay. 
especially you're forward planning for behavior, something that you cannot do with the replay buffers easily, and it does really seem to help. So just as a little bit, it's not always true. I didn't say the parametric models never help, right? Um, then, of course, I do agree that if your model has a good inductive bias, it's more likely to be useful, right? But we actually did this experiment where I wanted to basically illustrate that. Similar to these other things, I wanted to do like a very simple experiment that, that shows that. So I basically created a, a, a quadratic transition function, and I also said my model is going to be quadratic. So it is good like inductive bias, and it, like, you'll learn that in, in a couple of transitions, right? So very easy to learn. So it'll be perfect in no time, right? Um, and I was running that code, and it would just diverge all the time. So I was 100% certain that I had a bug somewhere. But turns out, there was no bug. But what was happening was, even though the model is now perfect, the data I was using, I was still sampling the real states that you've observed, right? And I was planning forwards from those with using this real model. But that real data was not exactly compatible with the model in the sense that this data will have a little bit of noise. The distribution of things I'm sampling as inputs is not quite the distribution you would get when you run the model. This kind of is, is very similar to off-policy updating now, and you basically get into the deadly tried, and this literally diverged, even though I gave it a very good inductive bias. So you still have to be a little bit careful when you use a parametric model that it still might be a little bit incompatible with uh, uh, what you're doing. Or phrased differently, you still have to be very careful about the state sampling distribution, right? Because using the true model, of course, you can do well. But you have to be a little bit careful about how you sample. You can still get algorithms that don't quite work for known reasons, but things that you might not think of, or at least I was not thinking of when I was running that experiment. But, but you would blame it on off-policy learning, right? In that case, yeah, we were accidentally learning off-policy, essentially, right? But we weren't quite realizing it because we were thinking, oh, but this model is true, and the data is true. Like, what's wrong with it? But we weren't quite realizing that we were still off-policy. Yeah? So when you say immediate behavior, I don't quite get it. What do you really mean by saying that? Um, you mean for the forward planning for immediate behavior? Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a good question. So what we specifically did there, consider doing Q learning. So you have an action value for each action in a state, right? Um, let's define a policy. Like that just gives you the action value. Now I have to define a policy. Let's define epsilon greedy to be the policy. So we pick the greedy action with a certain probability. We pick a random action with a different probability. Now what we did here, we have a model, right? So what we did for each action, instead of considering the action value immediately, instead for each action, we look at the state that you predict will happen then. And then on each of these actions in that state, you look at the value. And then you basically can max over like multiple plies deep. It's just doing search, right? Breadth first search. So for each action you back up, like what is the maximum action I can do over here? And then you backed it up, oh, that means that the, the, the maximum value that this action can attain according to the values that I'm bootstrapping on and, uh, and, and the model transitions, this will be the value of that action. And then you still do, like with probability epsilon, you still just select a random action. That's, that's exactly what we did. Um, there's actually a couple of papers about this now by Bruno Scherer and others. Um, on, they call this multi-step greedification, where you basically, it's basically search, right? But you can use this in the context of, uh, of reinforcement learning. You could potentially bootstrap on that as well. Um, yeah, so, but in this case, I think it's only optimal when your model is deterministic. Mm -hmm. If the environment yeah. is stochastic, then this is not an optimal solution. So that's, in get, again, that's a good observation. So this doesn't automatically work if your environment is stochastic. There are sub Sub, like, subclasses of cases in which it will still work. It also depends on your model, because you could imagine doing a full distribution model, and then you can still do this, right? And um, in this case, that's actually what we did, because it's a small experiment. In general, that's probably not the right way to go, because it'll be like a big thing to have the distribution of the next states, right? Um, then there's other things you can do. Rich wrote, wrote some stuff about that as well. You could have an expectation model, and maybe if your value function is linear, this is still okay. But otherwise, you could also have a sample model that only gives you like uh, a sample of the states that might, might appear, but then you kind of have to be careful with the planning. And the multi-step greedification also becomes a little bit, um, not hairy, it's like easy to do algorithmically, but the interpretation of it might be a little bit differently. So this is a lot of, there's a lot of 
to popping up like a level of abstraction. There's a lot of unsolved issues in all of these algorithms. There's a lot of ways to do that. What we did here are basically very simple instantiations. But you have to, like, if you want to do any of those for real, there's a lot of things you have to take into account and you want to, like, be very careful exactly about these types of considerations, how you deal with stochasticity and so on. And I don't think we have, like, complete solutions to that yet. Yes, Rich. I'll ask another question. Yeah. Um, you're comparing a uh, replay buffer to parametric model. And sometimes a replay buffer is another kind of model. It's a non-parametric model, though. Yeah. Um, could you do a, a, I mean, as you get more and more data, then it's, your, your, your replay buffer scales with T. Amount of time, and that's no good. Yeah. Um, so what you would do, uh, I mean, the memory can scale with t. Maybe that's not so bad, but but the computation. You, know, you said it was the replay buffer was computationally cheap, but but it's not really because you got this long history of the whole thing. And how do you find all the ones that that, that have all the different times that you visit a particular state, or if you've ever visited that state, mm -hmm. you have to build in indexes. And then if, if they, sometimes when you're in that state in the past, if there were two different things, yeah. you'd want to record that. You know, you'd really sort of cache indices into this huge stream of old experience. And if you, as you do more and more of that, it begins looking more like a classical model. Yeah. So, so what are we really comparing? So I think it's really good to dig into that a little bit more. So just to reiterate, you're pointing out, you can consider a replay a non-parametric model. You can actually also just extend it slightly to be a full non-parametric model, maybe also to be able to be, be queryable right, on state action pairs, for instance, by doing a nearest, nearest neighbor approach or something like that. You're also referring to the fact if your replay buffer grows, like the memory size will grow, which might be problematic in and of itself. Um, but it also takes longer if you want to query the computes to query something might take longer. Um, and all of that is true, and I'm also not, like, I don't think replay buffers are the solution in the end for those reasons as well. And I think eventually you want to cache a lot of that into more, like, succinct ways to represent things, like parametric models. Um, because a parametric model could essentially capture the same amount of capacity as a big replay buffer, but doesn't necessarily grow with the number of samples that you put in there. It can just get more accurate um, by, using this, by using the same compute and memory uh, imprint. But for, for maybe the nearer term, there's a valid question like what the trade-offs are that you want to admit. And one, one thing that would be interesting to ask in these, in these, this terminology, yeah. I mean, what would a non-parametric model look like? Yeah. What would that be? Yeah. Can, we, can we separate the step? all the way to parametric model into a step to non-parametric model and then to... Yeah, no, I, uh, I know Martha White and others have worked a little bit on this to, to augment the replay into a non-parametric model, for instance, using a kernel distance metric. Um, and I think that's a very promising approach because it opens up, for instance, the ability to do forward planning for behavior while still using a model that is really accurate at the states that you've actually seen because it's just, it's, it's just using the actual transitions there. And... Um, it's a really interesting question how that compares to other types of like parametric models and um, it might be better in some ways and I think nobody really knows like the right like answers to the trade-offs there. There's also different, different computational uh, questions there. How expensive is it indeed to query something? How expensive is it to do that nearest neighbor? Turns out nearest neighbors scales pretty good. Like there's good algorithms to, to do nearest neighbors on huge data sets. Um, so it's actually unclear for pretty large replay buffers, whether the compute is still more expensive than that really big ne deep neural network that they used for, for uh, the model-based approach here. But at some point, if you have enough data points, you know it will continue to grow with the data, so at some point it'll crash, like it'll be too much. Yeah? Last question. So in all of this research, I mean, everyone's using one-step models or one-step return and so on. Yeah. And in the linear world, just speculate if you have any thoughts on how this would change if you had multi-step models? Because yeah. instead of iterating one-step models, like you're doing 
Yeah, it's a great question. So the, the question is whether multi-step models, like what are their, how do they compare? How do they, how do they fit into this in some sense? And it, this is important because indeed, if you iterate a one-step model, you have a compounding error. If, even if there's a small error, like the error can exponentially scale up. And if you do many steps with a one-step model, even if it's only a little bit wrong, eventually it's very wrong, right? And that can be harmful potentially, depending on how you use it. And then multi-step models seem much more um, like promising. In addition, there's the compute question as well. Like with a multi-step model, maybe with the same compute, you could do like jumpy things far away into the future, rather than having to iterate all the way through. So most of the uh, experiments that I showed here were for one step, but we weren't iterating, right? We were literally just doing one step and then like catching that back in to do the kind of like clean comparisons. If you do multi-steps, if you do multiple steps, it becomes, uh, I think it's actually more promising than to have multi-step models, but this comes at a cost. And one important thing to point out in terms of like clear way to point out that cost is that a one-step model depends only on your action a forward model, but a multi-step model also depends on your policy in some way, right? So you have to somewhat and think about how, what, what should be the multi-step thing that you're doing. This goes into things like, if you think of this as a multi-step thing, you can also consider this an option conditional model, but then how do you find which option, right? Which option do you pick? Which policy do you pick that it's conditioned on? Do you keep that fixed? Or do you also want models for your current behavior, which would be a non-stationary thing? And this is again an area that is very promising, but there's a lot of questions that aren't, aren't fully resolved yet. I personally do believe that we're eventually going to ha need multi-step models, because that's the only way to effectively compute, compute effectively fairly far into the future. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> thank you again. <laughs>